So next up we have, uh, we have Kenneth Love, who's gonna tell us about how classy Django's views can be. Um, just for your information, these slides and audio are gonna be um, outside as well. If you go like right next to this room, uh, you'll be able to hear the audio and see the slides. You won't be able to see Kenneth, but you know, um, what can you do? Uh, so without further ado, Kenneth Love. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks a lot for, for being here. Um, <laughs> you haven't sufficiently welcomed me yet. All right, there we go. So <laughs> this talk is called uh, Views Can Be Classy. Um, I was told by PyDanny after the fact that apparently pun-based names never get in, uh, into DjangoCon, but he's wrong. So, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name's Kenneth Love, as you know. I'm also Kenneth Love on Twitter, Dunder Love Dunder on IRC, and I blog at bracket.com. Uh, I'm a freelance Django developer. I write pretty much nothing but Django all day, every day. And um, my main client right now is building one giant CMS, and that's where we've started using class-based views, which is what I wanna talk about. So if you've been following all the Django stuff on the internet, you know that class-based views are bad, right? People are speaking out against them. They're horrible, such a great, terrible idea. Um, let's talk about some of the bad stuff. By default, uh, decorators have to be wrapped around dispatch, which means you have to rewrite dispatch every single time. That's very, very annoying. Um, or around a view in urls.py or an extra variable. We're gonna solve that, but that's part of the bad stuff. That's what's there. Inheritance chains, which make the code concise, and that's kind of a double-edged sword, because people that are new to your project aren't really gonna understand what's going on because your view is 10 lines long but does a huge amount of stuff. Makes it very dense and hard for new developers to pick up. Great thing is you can solve this with documentation. Um, I'll let you into a secret about every single project you've ever worked on. It doesn't have enough documentation. None of mine do. No exception, but that does help a lot. The next thing is that combining mixins and views sometimes, very rarely, results in method resolution order exceptions, which are bad. And there's, as I said, a lot more going on behind the scenes than function-based views. It's not all just out in the open where you can see everything as it's going on. Python has the scariest TLAs. Uh, if you don't know what a TLA stands for, it's a three-letter acronym which is the best three-letter acronym there's ever been. Python has the PIL, JIL, and MRO, which is method resolution order. Again, it's fairly rare. I've run into it a couple of times in the year, two years I've been writing nothing but class-based views. Um, most of the time when it happens, it's because you've got two classes that inherit from one or more common base classes, and, but they extend the functions and call the functions in different orders. And so Python basically just gets lost, doesn't know what to call next. There are a lot of different ways that you can fix this. You can redefine MRO. You can manually define what order the functions should be called in, and um, quite a bit more. I don't want to go into all of this. You can go to bit.ly slash Python MRO, and it'll take you to a great um, essay on the python.org site about dealing with MRO. Or you can just Google for it, and you'll find tons of other people with problems and solutions. And the last really bad thing is the enterprise because nobody wants their Python to look and feel like Java. But being a little bit enterprise-ish isn't really a bad thing. It makes it to where you can implement features a lot faster if you're doing this in small doses. Uh, most large projects, projects that you end up building, you do the same thing over and over and over again, but you've got different templates, different models, different workflows, but you're doing the same work. So having class-based views, something that's more enterprise -y, makes it to where you're basically assembling building blocks to get the product you want, and you can spend more time making your product awesome and less time, you know, writing render methods. So why should you use CVVs? Because they're so horrible. Um, all that extra work that you're going to do up front, and you're going to do a lot more extra work, it pays off down the line. As I mentioned, you can implement things a lot faster. And it keeps your views up high concise, so it's a lot faster to see what's going on in any given app in all of its views. You can kind of skim the views.py. Once you know all of your mixins and everything, it's very easy to see what's actually going on without having to read through a 100-line view. 
And my best reason for why you should use class-based views is because in Django, everything, with an asterisk, is a class. Models are classes, right? We're all used to that one. Uh, forms are all classes. Um, and I'm sure all of you who've been doing Django for any amount of time have built abstract-based class models and abstract form classes that you end up inheriting from to save yourself from doing work. Templates are classes because they extend from uh, master classes or master layouts. They have overridable functions, which we call blocks, and they get mix-ins in the form of template tags. And according to the DAO of Python, special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, which means views should be classes too. Logic, right? Done, schooled. Um, but this is Django, everybody has deadlines, it's for perfectionists with deadlines, and so Django has tons of batteries included. This is what makes class-based views actually usable. If you had to write all these yourselves, it would be pointless to do. So the first set is the object-based views. Um, there are two mix-ins that you commonly deal with for objects, they're the single object mix-in and the multiple object mix-in. I doubt I have to explain what they do, they pull single and multiple objects out of the database. And they're used correspondingly by the base view, detail view, and list view to show a single item or multiple items. There are also the form-based views, which again have two mix-ins which deal with standard forms and with model forms. And the base classes that come from them, form view, which just displays standard forms, create view, and update view, which deal with model and model forms. There are the date-based ones, and there's like seriously twice as many as I put on here. Um, they basically deal with selecting things from the database based on dates within the model instance. So if you have a created at or an updated at, you can select based on those uh, attributes. And then there are the utility views that everyone kind of ends up using. Um, the template response mix in just handles sending back a template with, uh, with the response object in it. Um, there's the template view, which obviously renders a template. The redirect view, which just handles taking a git and redirecting to somewhere else and then the standard view, which if you're building your own base views, that's what you're going to uh, tie off of. Amongst all of these views, though, there are some very common methods. These are ones that I find myself overriding constantly, and I'm sure you will as well. Uh, the first one is dispatch. Dispatch handles taking the HTTP verb that comes in and running the appropriate function to go along with it. So if a git request comes in, it runs the git uh, method, or post, put, delete, and so on. There is also a git context data method, which handles building the dictionary that you pass back to the template. So this is your entire context for your view. There is git object, which handles selecting the single item out of your query set that you want to use. And git query set, which handles getting that initial query set. These two get overridden a whole lot, especially if you need to do filtering later on or you need to manipulate how it's fetched. Get form class and get form quards used together help you instantiate forms. So form class is a way to programmatically override which class of form is being pulled out. So perhaps you need to, again, change the form based on the user. Super user gets a certain form, staff users get a different one, non-logged in users get a third one. And form quards lets you handle the quards that go to the form. So if you need to, uh, for instance, pass in the user or the request object, you do it through that method. Get success URL handles where to redirect to once a create or update view is successful. Um, the reason this one ends up getting overridden a lot is if you need to do a reverse on a URL name or if you want to, say, load in uh, a message into the messages framework. Form valid and form invalid both handle the valid and invalid states of forms to where um, they're, they're what happens once the form is valid or invalid. So again, form valid is very handy for messages, form invalid is as well. Form valid is also handy for invalidating cache or modifying uh, uh, sister models. So I'm gonna get away from just kind of talking about what's available. Um, PyDanny was friendly and happy enough to lend me some code. This is from his project Open Comparison, which you've all seen on Django packages. So we're gonna look at a view that he has in production. So I'm sure a lot of you have built function-based views like this. So it takes a request, takes a slug, has a template name, goes and selects an object or throws a 404 from the uh, database, gets a couple of items off of the model that he pulled out, and grabs a, another element, another model, rather, that's the element model, 
And then he calls a function that's inside of his views.py file. That's important. We're going to talk about that more later. Has a giant list of tuples, which I didn't include because you don't need to see them. And then returns the render method with all of the stuff that he's assembled. So the method that he calls is this one, which is build element map. And it basically builds a two-level deep dict full of data on the elements that he's passed in. But this gets called in probably half or more of the views in that one application's views.py file. So it's a fairly important piece of the functionality for these views. So we're going to look at converting that to class-based views. So since that gets used a lot, the function gets used a lot, to me it makes sense to make it into a mixin. So we're going to build a very simple mixin. Just build element map mixin, nothing creative on the name. And it just builds itself off of object because we don't need any special functionality. It's going to implement the exact same function, which is build element map, and it does exactly the same thing as it does in the old one. So if you end up having functions that you use in your views.py a lot, making them into a mixin is very simple. You basically just move the code inside of a class. Then we're going to look at the class for the actual view. So it's a grid detail view, and it's going to extend the build element map mixin because we want that method. And since it's a detail view, we're going to extend detail view. We specify that the model is grid, which we've already imported, and we set the template name. And then all the rest of the work that we do is inside get context data because we want to manipulate ultimately the dict that goes to render. So the first thing we do is by calling super, we get the quargs as they are at this point in the views state. So if there had been other mixins that had modified the context, we would now get those changes. If um, other views extend this one later on and they modify get context data so long as they do super, they will get all of these changes that we're going to do. So then we pull features and grid packages off the object as before. The only difference here is instead of having a variable named grid, we have self.object, which is always around and that represents the object selected by get object. Elements we grab as we did before, nothing different there. Element map is exactly the same, only instead of just calling build element map, we now have to put self at the beginning of it because it's part of our class. The default attributes list again is omitted. And then at the end, we just update our quargs dict. So we add in features, grid packages, attributes, and elements, just as PyDanny did before, and we return our quargs. We don't have to call render. We don't have to, we don't have to do anything at this point. The view will render, and all of our dict, or our, our dict will be filled out with all of our elements. It's really nice. It shows you it's not that hard to go from function-based to class-based views. They're very, very similar. But the problem is not everybody likes all these defaults. I like them because it means I can copy and paste templates, but not everybody likes this. So you can customize things. Uh, if you need to, you can override the name that's passed for the object to the, uh, to the template. If you don't want object as your variable name, you can give it a new one, in this case, grid, so that his old templates would still work exactly as they did before. Uh, you can also override the template as I showed you before. You can override pretty much anything else, the form, the object list, all of these things. There's a ton of variables that you can override, and you can add your own variables that can be overridden in mixins later on. So what's the difference between a mixin and a base class? You've heard me mention base classes, base views. The difference is there really isn't a difference. Um, Python doesn't care. Python sees them both as being the exact same thing. So it's kind of a convention. Usually, mixins do a single thing. They update the context data. They override the form. They change how it gets rendered to JSON instead of HTML. But a view or a base class might contain multiple mixins, or it contains wholly new elements that it will implement on its own. Um, a, a good example of these is the, uh, the form views in Django's actual class-based views, where they override, um, I think it's get context data to do the form render. It's a little weird, but it's a way of showing you how it kind of works. And then method mixins versus decorators. A lot of you probably use decorators on your views. They're fairly common. Uh, you can't just wrap a function inside of a class-based view with a decorator. Uh, it'll lose what self is, and it doesn't usually end up passing through args and quargs, and so your methods don't work. So most mixins end up replacing decorators. So for instance, as you'll see in a moment, instead of having a login required decorator on a view, you'll have a login required mixin that you attach to the view to make it require login. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about creating your own mixins. And we'll show exactly the login required one. Um, as you can see, there's nothing really special here. It extends object again. And it uses the method decorator, decorator from Django which handles the whole passing through of self, args, and quarks, so you don't lose them. If you have to wrap a decorator around dispatch inside of your uh, views or your mixins, this is the way to do it, is with method decorator. And you'll notice on dispatch, all we do is we immediately return the super. We don't want to mess with it. We don't want to modify this at all. 
We just want to make sure that they're logged in and then immediately go on to whatever the view is supposed to do. Or we can have something a little bit more complicated like a project filter mix in. Uh, for the purpose of this, assume you have a model uh, called project that hangs out somewhere and that in your session you're holding on to the PK of a project that someone's working on. So what you can do is you can filter all of your records in your query set so that they all relate back to that project without ever having to manually specify this per view. You do it one time, everything's filtered. The only caveat is that you have to have a variable named project on every one of them. So that kind of brings me to design patterns for mixins. How, how should you write these so that they're actually extendable and they don't surprise people as they're using your mixins? So this is an example of one of the ones that I've written and use quite often. It's called the set headline mixin. The idea for this one is we had a whole lot of views that would render out a form or a list or a detail. And we wanted to use basically the exact same template, but we wanted to be able to specify that this one says add new foo, and this other one says edit foo named bar. So being able to do that programmatically makes it a whole lot easier than having to go and create new templates for all of these or make sure the template always had the same object or whatever. So all this one does is we have headline equals none because we want to give them a default that's absolutely blank. We don't want to assume anything on what they're doing. Uh, then we're going to just override context data. So we get our quargs like default, and we have our quargs that we update to include a new variable named headline, which comes back as the uh, content of the self.getHeadline method. And then getHeadline itself doesn't actually do anything in this one, as you probably noticed. It really just raises an error if they haven't supplied a headline. So the idea is if you extend this mixin and need to programmatically set your headline, you would override get headline to tell Django how to build your headline variable. So if we have a blog view, and we can include the set headline mixin, it's a detail view. And I can set that the headline is always my awesome blog, because all blogs are awesome. Or I can override it because I want every single page to have the title of the blog post that I'm on. Now granted, this is a very simple one. This can be done in a template, but it still shows you how to use the uh, override. So I mentioned earlier, decorating views was not pretty. So these are basically the two ways that you can do it according to the docs, other than overriding dispatch. You can either wrap login required around your call to the view inside of your urls.py, which I don't like because that's putting view logic that a login should be required inside your urls.py, which really should just be handling regexes. Or in views.py, you can instantiate a new variable called perhaps blog view, and again, wrap the as view method of your class in there. That one's a little cleaner. It's keeping it inside views.py, but you're now adding a second variable for a single item. You have to remember that it's down there. You have to go change it. It's kind of like dealing with signals. They get forgotten. So that's why we have a mixin. If we have the login required mixin that you saw earlier and we just apply it to our blog view, then it's immediately login required. Nobody can get to it unless they're logged in. We don't have to specify anything else. And I realized I left in model equals profile. Oh, well. Uh, as you probably noticed, all my mixins have gone to the front when I'm doing my uh, inheritance chains. This helps to avoid a lot of the MRO problems. You know that all of yours are written based off of object or off of another mixin, so you kind of know the order that they're running through, and you're just helping to ensure that your classes follow that exact same order. And another good thing is an example of like login required or a permissions required one, if the user doesn't meet those requirements, they're not logged in, they don't have that permission, putting them at the beginning of your inheritance chain stops code from executing that doesn't need to execute. There's no reason to go and fetch all the stuff from the database if they're not logged in and don't get to see it anyway. So you save yourself some, some time. To save even more time, there's Django Braces, which I wrote with uh, my friend Chris Jones, who is on Twitter as Tay Jones. Uh, you can install it from pip. You can read the uh, docs on read the docs. And the basic idea behind this was to handle all the decorators that we commonly use and the common use cases for mixins that we have and give them something that the community can use and, uh, and to find you know, handy, hopefully. We just launched a new one the other day which does uh, multiple permissions required, which is uh, actually a little tricky to do in Django with decorators. So kind of nice. You should check it out. So the common uses that we cover are login required, permission required, uh, that it has to be a super user or a staff user to see this. Uh, we also do the headline, and we have plugins or mixins for uh, sending through specific form quarks and things like that, things that we end up using very, very often. Uh, with all that said, though, I do still find places that function-based views are handy. I myself don't write them. That's kind of that last bullet point. 
but uh, I find views that really just manipulate session, log in, log out, uh, adding a variable into session, whatever, are a great place to use function-based views. I also think function-based views are very, very handy if you're building a, say, smaller open source project where you don't necessarily want people to have to read through all of your mix-ins and all of your class bases, or all of your class views in order to figure out what you're doing. So a function-based view is still a much lower barrier to entry than class-based views are. And as I said, if you want to avoid them, they can be avoided. Uh, the redirect view is great for manipulating sessions. So, because that's basically what you do in function-based views. There are a couple of cases that I've had people tell me wouldn't work for class-based views, that you had to have function-based views to make these simple. So the first one of these is multiple forms. I wanna show two forms on one view in the template and validate it, make sure it actually works. So we'll look at that, it's fairly simple actually. So we have a template view which renders out the template forms.html. And in get context data, we instantiate two forms which are passed either the, the post from the request or none. And then we update our quarks and return them back. Nothing special, just again like you would do in a function-based view. And then inside our def post, which will be run by the dispatch, we check to see if form one is valid and if form two is valid. And if they both are, then we call save on both of them and we redirect to wherever we want to redirect to. If they're not, then we just continue on with the rendering as we normally would do and you get all of your errors and you get the template rendered again. The other one is having user-owned content, having to filter the query set constantly just for the user that's logged in or just based on that user's permissions. So for this example, we have again a projects view with our project model. And in our query set, we want to filter it to where it's only the super user. Now we actually had a mix-in earlier that does exactly this, but if you didn't want to use the mix-in, this is how it would be done, just inside of a standard view. And inside the query set again, we get our default query set, and then we filter it if they're not a super user. And I think I actually went a little quick, but thank you. That's the talk. Um, <laughs> you can come find me at any time, tell me if you like class-based views or hate them, we can argue, whatever. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I was just wondering if there's any way in the URLs to specify a string for the view instead of uh, the object so you don't have to import it in the view, or, or if that's just uh, a constraint. I, I, I missed the first part, so use what? So uh, uh, use a string in the urls.py to... Um, oh, instead of importing the class? Yeah. Uh, the way you could do it is, uh, the example that I showed where there was the extra variable that was wrapped with login required, you could do that without the login required decorator, and so then you just have that extra variable that's floating around in your views.py, and you can then just use a string like you normally do with function-based views. And it'll work exactly the same way. Thanks. So as you said before, um, class-based views are evil, right? Yeah. Right, they're horrible. Um, so I was wondering, like, what, what can the Django community do to, uh, I guess, educate on class-based views, I guess? <laughs> well, one of the biggest stumbling blocks to using class-based views so far has been that the documentation that's there is a little lacking, and there wasn't much documentation there until a few months ago. Um, so the hardest thing at that point was you had to go read the source to figure out how to use class-based views. That's what Chris and I had to do, was we had to constantly go, you know, we had GitHub open all the time to Django project. Um, so the best thing you can do right now is, is contribute to the documentation, of course. There's a, a big branch open on that uh, that PyDanny is in charge of. Um, and then just using them more. I, I think one of the things that makes them a little scary is writing a function's no big deal, but building a whole new class seems kind of scary. But classes really aren't anything special. So I, I think if more people get over that fear of building a class, it'll be a lot, a lot more accessible to people. Have you compared performance between class-based views and function-based views? Um, I know, for, for example, in Flask, class-based uh, view processing is uh, quite a bit slower than function-based views. I, I haven't done any like, actual time tests or anything, but um, we had a, a fairly large system that was all function-based views. We went through and converted them all to class-based views and have not noticed any deterioration in speed. Uh, everything seems to run fairly quickly. All of our tests that test the class-based views all run quickly. So it, I'm sure there is a performance difference between the two, but it doesn't seem to be noticeable. It could depend on what you're doing inside the view, though. One more quick question. Mm -hmm. I, I think I read something that function-based views are, are potentially 
uh, deprecated and, and maybe on the way out in Django? Do you know anything about this, like what the future of the view system is going to be or anything? From what I understand, it's not that function-based views are going to be deprecated. I don't, I don't think they could ever really get away with saying you can't write a function-based view. The idea is that the function-based generic views that exist, the ones that everybody used before Django, especially before Django 1.4, but mainly before 1.3, are going away. Um, they've been replaced by the class-based views. You don't really need them anymore. Um, but yeah, I don't believe they'll ever get rid of actual function-based views. Thank you. I wonder if you could uh, share with us how you've changed your approach to testing views. It really hasn't changed. Okay. Um, I mean, you, you still basically, you know, uh, pull up the test client, have it hit a URL, and then verify that, you know, like certain things are in the template or that the query set matches a, a certain size or whatever. So there really hasn't been much change. Um, probably the biggest change has been the fact that now I can test a larger feature of a view by testing what the mixin does. So if I know the mixin works, I don't really have to worry about testing that same functionality in views A, B, C, and D. I can just do it in A. I can talk about my Kickstarter. I was going to do a lightning talk on it, but um, I can talk about it. So if you don't know, I'm running a Kickstarter uh, for my Django video series called Getting Started with Django. Um, the good thing is we've already met the funding goal. Bad thing is we haven't met the stretch goal yet. Uh, the funding goal was $5,000, and it's going to produce a series of 10 half an hour to an hour long videos over best practices for actually building something real with Django. You can only go so far with a Pulse tutorial or the other tutorials you find on the internet. And if any of you browse around like Django packages or PyPy, there is an insane amount of packages out there for Django. So the idea is to produce a how to move beyond tutorials series and what packages and workflows are actually really good to use. Why you should be using Fabric and South and Crispy Forms and things like that. Uh, if you want to, to contribute to it, uh, you can search for Getting Started with Django on Kickstarter and you will find it. If we get to $7,500, which we're about $1,000 away from right now, all the, views will, or all the videos will be free. So anybody that wants to can view them for free in high def, download them, do whatever you want. Uh, if we get to 10K, which is probably unlikely, I'm going to do a second series of Q&A videos where somebody that comes up with questions that are common and somewhat difficult to explain, we'll go through them live on video and show how to solve it. Well, thank you.